You're watching a video created by Schweitzer United Methodist Church in Springfield, Missouri. Thanks so much for watching. Hi, I'm Mary Beth, and you're watching Behind the Scenes at Schweitzer Church. What's up? Hey Tim, how's it going? Uh, it's pretty good. I'm pretty stressed, honestly, right now. Pretty swamped. Oh, that's too bad. Is there anything I can do to help? I'm trying to get some dinner stuff figured out still for tonight for youth. So uh, I'm thinking about probably just getting pizza or something. Pizza? That's lame. Let me make dinner. Uh, all right, I guess, if you don't mind. All right, I'm on it. OK, so see ya. Honestly, I don't have real high hopes of this dinner that Taylor's about to make tonight. Let's get ready for pasta! That's why we wear gloves. I'm not saying I'm the best cook in the world, but I can at least make spaghetti. I've got to hand it to him though. I'm pretty excited to see what he comes up with for the meal tonight. Hey, yeah, I'm gonna need 20 pizzas. Well, friends, good morning. My name is Spencer, and I'm the pastor here. If you have your Bibles, we're reading from Acts chapter 16 today. This is part two of a six-week series called Behind the Scenes. And really, this series is built off two convictions that I have. One, um, I believe that every single one of us, all of us who are in Christ, all of us are called by God to, to make a difference in the world. Uh, that God puts opportunities in front of us to make a difference. And to say that differently, I think God has called all of us who are in Christ to be leaders, um, to shape and, and to influence and to, and to help take people into, into places that, that change their lives. And so I, I, that's, that's leadership. And so I believe that God has called all of us into, into leadership. That's one of my convictions. Uh, the second one that this series is built off of is that leadership, while we're using that word, uh, comes in all kinds of shapes and sizes. There's not a one size fits all when it comes to leadership. And what tends to happen with that word leadership is that many of us uh, take a very narrow view of leadership. We, we think about leadership and we think about the organization chart or, or we think about who's in charge and making decisions and, and who is it that's uh, got the microphone and out front. And, and that's a lot of how we think about leadership. We've got this narrow view of, of what it is. And, and my goal in this series is to take this narrow view of, of leadership and to, and to look at this through a wide lens because leadership does not come in one shape or size. There's opportunities for all of us in our lives uh, to make a difference, to influence uh, folks and to lead them into what God has for them. And so I want to show us some practical ways to do this. And so in this series, to, to broaden our, our view of leadership, what, what we're looking at in the series are six leaders in the Bible. Um, none of these are the people who are writing the books or preaching the sermons. These are what we might call behind the scenes leaders. Uh, these are people who do simple acts that make a big difference in the movement of the, the Christian movement, the early Christian movement. These are the kinds of people that, that when I look at what they did, it, there's a temptation to see this as a small thing that they do. Um, but really, if you think about it more deeply, I, some of these people, all these people really, I'm, I'm left wondering if, if they hadn't done what they did, would we even be here today? Their, their leadership is so um, important, even though there's going to be temptation on our part to read past them because they're not Paul or Moses or David or Esther. They're, they're people some of us have never heard of before. And so we're, we're looking at these, um, these behind-the-scenes leaders who make a big difference in what they do. So last week we met Ananias. Ananias demonstrated for us the key trait that is um, going to be true for anyone who displays leadership and makes a difference, and that is the, the courage that, that Ananias doesn't wait for somebody else to do the work, that he jumps in and follows God, and, and so we saw that. The next five that we're going to see are, are not so much about character traits. These are going to be some very practical things that we see demonstrated from, from these key people in the Scripture, even though maybe some of these you've never heard of before, never met them. So last week was Ananias. This morning I want to introduce you to Lydia. Acts chapter 16 is where we meet Lydia. Um, Acts 16, this is, at this point in the story, Paul 
is traveling the, the Greek Roman world, the Greco Roman world, and he's starting churches and he's going from Greek city to Greek city starting churches. And when I say he's starting churches, I don't mean he's building buildings. These aren't, you know, big churches, these aren't mega churches. These are just a few dozen people who um, gather together as part of the Christian community in these Greek cities. And, and the way that Paul started churches is he would show up to town and he would go to the synagogue and he would start meeting with the local Jewish population and share with them the, the good news about Jesus, the long awaited Messiah. He was also making tents during the daytime, and he'd go to the marketplace and meet uh, non-Jewish people, Gentiles, and start sharing with them as well. And so this is what we're going to read is, is the, the planting of the church in Philippi, which is where we get the book Philippians. So Acts chapter 16, here's what we read, starting in verse 11. It says, From Troas we put out to sea and sailed straight for Samothrace, and the next day we went to Neapolis. From there we traveled to Philippi, a Roman colony, and the leading city of that district of Macedonia, and we stayed there several days. On the Sabbath, we went outside the city gate to the river where we expected to find a place of prayer. They're going outside the city to the place of prayer in the river because there's no synagogue in Philippi, and so this is where the Jewish population would, would gather. So they're going uh, to look for, for the Jewish uh, people there in the city. He says, we sat down and began to speak to the women who had gathered there. One of those listening was a woman from the city of Thyatira named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth, which probably means that Lydia is fairly well off as her purple cloth would be high-end customers, high-end clients that she would sell to. And then Paul, Luke has this, this really interesting line. Just He says this about her. It says, she was a worshiper of God. That's kind of code for um, she's a, a Gentile, non, non-Jewish, but she uh, practices Judaism. And so this is what she is. Some people call those God fears, but this is who she is. She's a non-Jewish practicer of Judaism. And um, when she meets Paul, Luke tells us this is what happens. It says, the Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. So she meets Paul. The Lord opens her heart to this message. She receives Christ as her Savior. Uh, she's got this new faith in him. Her hope, her trust is in, is in Jesus. And I want to show you what she does with this newfound faith that she's living into Because here's what we read next in verse 15. It says, When she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited us to her home. If you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my house. And she persuaded us. And I'm going to skip a whole bunch of verses because after this, Paul gets in trouble with the authorities. He's arrested. He goes to prison. And then coming out of prison uh, at the very end of this uh, section of Philippi, just verse 40, this is what we read. It says, After Paul and Silas came out of the prison, They went to Lydia's house where they met with the brothers and sisters and encouraged them, and then they left. So this is Lydia. Two very important things I want you to know about Lydia. First, Lydia is from Thyatira. She is the first recorded European believer in Jesus, the first recorded European Christian, which is highly significant that she is the first person from the European continent to believe. Secondly, that Lydia, what she does here, while it may be tempting to to read past this as a small thing, she does this thing, this this action, that uh, if she hadn't done it, I'm not sure what we would have ended up with. I'm, I'm not sure... Uh, We would have ended up with the letter of Philippians. Think about some of the great verses from Philippians. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. I'm not sure we'd have that letter if it wasn't for Lydia. I'm I'm not sure what would have happened to the European movement that took place because she um, provided the first place for the Christians to meet. And I I wonder, would the gospel have taken root in in Europe if it hadn't been for Lydia? Lydia does this, this small thing. This small thing that's highly significant, and yet it's tempting just to see what she does and to read past it because it's not about Paul. Paul has all the action in the story, but Lydia does this small thing that's so important, and all she does here, what we read, is that she opens her home. She opens her home for ministry. That's what she does. And what she does there, she provides the first uh, church in, in Europe because what happened then is you didn't have church buildings. The, the Christians met in homes and she provided her home to basically be the first um, church building in Europe. She, she allowed uh, the Philippian church to, to meet there. I wonder if it's because of her act of opening her home. Is this why the gospel was able to take root in Philippi? Is this, is this an action that allowed that to take place? When I think about Lydia, it's a small thing that she does but I'm not sure what we would have ended up with if she hadn't done this because it's, it's that significant. It's so, so significant. Now, of course, the word that you and I would use to describe what Lydia does is, is this word. We would describe it as hospitality. She opens her home. She invites people in. She provides for them. She provides a place for the church to meet, and this is what she does. And, of course, hospitality in the Bible was a major theme 
In the Old Testament, cities are destroyed because of a lack of hospitality. In the New Testament, hospitality is a key Christian behavior. Let me just show you a few examples. Romans chapter 12, uh, for instance, verse 3 says, Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. That's Romans 12, 3. Here's another one. Hebrews um, 13 says, Do not forget to show hospitality to strangers, for by doing so, uh, people have shown uh, hospitality to angels without knowing it. One more, 1 Peter uh, chapter 4 says, Offer hospitality to one another um, without grumbling. And so we read this. I could have gone on and on and on with lots more verses because there's a ton of verses in the New Testament about the, the importance of, of Christians practicing hospitality. And, and this is what we see Lydia doing, is that she's practicing hospitality. Now, probably most of us, um, when we hear that word hospitality, most of us probably don't think, ah, leadership. Because for most of us, we hear hospitality, we, th- we hear leadership, and, and again, what we do is we have a very narrow view of what these things are. We have a narrow view of leadership, and we have a narrow view of hospitality, and because of this, we are tempted sometimes to think that it's a small thing, when, when actually it's a, it's, a very, it's a very big thing. But, but we need to understand is, is that it's more than just this narrow view that we have of, of hospitality. Um, for instance, just to show you how narrow our thinking is, um, when I got married, my wife and I, we were, we were young when we got married, we were 21, we had nothing, like nothing when we got married. And so you do what you do when you get married, and we went and, and registered for gifts and and people gave us all kinds of things that, that uh, we didn't have because we didn't have anything when we got married. We, we got plates. And then it's not just that we got plates. We got fancy plates. China. Maybe we've used it one time. I don't know. It's moved with us like house to house to house to house. And maybe we've used it one time. But we got fancy plates. We got linens. But not just linens. We got fancy linens. And, and we got all this fancy stuff. In fact, our, our linens um, were, were monogrammed. They were, they were so fancy. They were, they were like really, really nice linens. Our towels and sheets, they were monogrammed. I don't know if you know this or not, but there's a tradition when you monogram things for a family that you, you put the initials of the couple, the family that's there, and it's the wife's first name, the husband's first name, and, and the last name. That's the tradition. I didn't know that until I got these linens. And so my wife's first name is Abby. My name is Spencer. Our last name is Smith. You all can spell, apparently. <laughs> we had these really nice linens. A family member gave it to us, and she was mortified when she saw what it spelled as these big block letters on our towels that we had. <laughs> that was a good laugh. I appreciate that. That was good. <laughs> and so why is it that we got these fancy plates as well as regular plates? Why do we get these fancy uh, linens with a mild cuss word printed on them, as well as the normal linens that we got. Well, we got those because those were for our guests, right? We're going to have people over. We're going to host people. We have the nice things for, for when we have people over. And this is the narrow view that we have of hospitality. Uh, that hospitality is about the fancy plates or the fancy towels. It's about cleaning the house up. It's about having people over for dinner. This is the narrow view uh, that we have of hospitality. And what I want to show us this morning is while some of us here have incredible gifts for hosting people in that, in that view, you are, you are great at bringing people together and you provide a, a welcoming environment for people and you, you can throw a great dinner party. And I just I affirm that this is, that is what hospitality is, but it's also bigger than that. And I, I want to take, take our view that some of us might have of a narrow view, and I want to show you this in a much larger perspective, because this larger perspective is something that even if you don't have gifts for that kind of thing, like I, I don't have gifts for that kind of thing, but if you're like me and you don't have gifts for that kind of thing, I, I want to show you that, that even you have a responsibility, though, to practice hospitality in a biblical sense of what this is. So just in a biblical, wider view of hospitality, let's, let's throw open our, our wide-angle lens and look at this in a bigger sense. And to do that, um, let's talk language. In the Greek uh, New Testament, remember the New Testament was not written in English, it was written in Greek. Um, The dominant word that's translated for hospitality, the root word of that is this, it's xenos. Xenos is interesting, it's a fascinating word. Uh, Xenos can mean three things. It can mean guest, which you can obviously understand why it would be um, hospitality, because hospitality is about making people your guest. Uh, Xenos can also mean stranger. And again, you can see how that'd be related to hospitality as you're, you're welcoming strangers in. That's part of what hospitality is. But really fascinatingly, um, xenos can also mean enemy. Think of the word, the English word that we have, uh, xenophobia. Right? It's the fear of people from other countries or other, other ethnicities. And, and it's a, a term that's associated with racism. It's, it's a, making an enemy of, of other people is, is xenophobia. 
And what scholars tell us, people who study ancient languages, is that in most ancient languages, um, Greek being an exception of this, as, as is Hebrew, but in most ancient languages, um, there is not a separate word for stranger and enemy. In most ancient languages, stranger and enemy are the same word, which is a fascinating thing to think about. That in the ancient world, if you were a stranger, you were also my enemy. If you were in my enemy, you were also my stranger. This is how this thing worked together. And, and when you start to think about what Jesus preached and the world that Jesus emerged in, and Jesus who said things like to love your enemies, you, you think about how powerful that is when you think about how strangers and enemies were the same classification of people in those days. Paul as well, this is the world which Paul emerged, where strangers were your enemies and your enemies were your strangers. It was the same uh, the same thing that, that we see here. And so this call for hospitality, you see, it's, it's not so much that it's about dinner parties and fancy plates and having um, the fancy towels out and cleaning the house and getting dinner prepared. That's, that's not really what hospitality is about in a, in a much broader sense of that. What hospitality is, is it's, it's tearing down the walls that make the stranger into your enemy. It's tearing down the walls between those that, that would divide us and, and make strangers out of us. It's tearing down the walls so that the stranger and your enemy become your guest. And it's tearing down these walls to welcome that relationship in that, that would open somebody up for what God would do in their life. Because you see, hospitality is this profoundly powerful act that when we see that in a broader sense, that it's about tearing down the walls that make strangers into enemies, it's this profoundly powerful act that can seriously move the needle in somebody's life. And the reason why hospitality is so powerful is because it's really rooted in the gospel. It's rooted in the gospel. Let me give you a really simple definition of the gospel. If you ever wonder, what is the gospel? Let me give you a really simple definition of the gospel. This, you might want to email me later because you think it's incorrect, but this is my simple definition of the gospel. And I'm going to give you this in three words. I think you can understand the gospel in three words. And here's how it goes. Uh, me for you. That's really the gospel. Me for you. Think about this. Jesus, the Son of God, goes on the cross. He offers himself for you on behalf of you. He takes what was yours, which is death, um, what was yours, which is death because of sin, he takes that upon himself in his own body. He gives himself for you. He sacrificed himself for you so that you might have life and life eternal. This is what Jesus does. And this is really the action that you see demonstrated when people practice hospitality in the broad sense, is that what we do is we take um, our time, our energy, our money, our passion, our service, our, our effort, and, and what we're doing is we're offering that on behalf of somebody else. It's, a, it's an action that demonstrates what Jesus has done for us, this me for you. My time, my energy, my effort, my sacrifice, my money, my, uh, my effort for you. This is what I'm doing when I practice hospitality. This is, this is why it's so powerful is it's, it's rooted in demonstrating to people the gospel and the love of God that's been shown to them. This is what happens when we practice hospitalities. We are, we are demonstrating the gospel to people. Jesus told a story about this. Uh, the story goes like this. Once there was this man who was going from Jerusalem to Jericho. And the, road to, the route to Jericho from Jerusalem is, is a famously dangerous route, but it's the shortest distance between the cities. And so this man was going from one city to the other. And on the way, this man was robbed. He was mugged, mugged and, and he, was, he was beaten up and everything was stolen from him. And he was left for dead. As he's laying on the side of the road with everything gone, he sees a, a person approaching. The person is a priest and he thinks to himself, yes, the, the preacher is here. I'm going to be saved. The preacher, though, looks at this man. He pretends he doesn't see him. He crosses to the other side of the road and he keeps on going. Next comes a Levite, which is like a church leader. And again, he sees the Levite coming, the church leader coming. And he thinks, yes, I'm saved. The Levite's here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be fine. But again, the Levite does exactly what the priest does. And he pretends he doesn't see. And he crosses to the other side of the road and he keeps on going. Eventually, a Samaritan comes along. Samaritans and Jews are enemies. They're strangers to one another. They don't, they don't have any relationship with one another. And the stranger, or the, the Samaritan, it says, uh, sees the man who's been left for dead and everything robbed from him. And he sees this man. He has mercy on him. And so he takes this man, he picks him up, he puts him on his own donkey, he walks him to town, he puts him in an inn, he pays for his medical treatment, he pays for his treatment altogether, he takes care of him so that he might be well. Now oftentimes this very famous story is not one that we would normally think of as a story about hospitality, but it is. 
It's exactly a story about hospitality, even though it doesn't have anything to do with a dinner party. It's a story about hospitality because it's a story of a me-for-you kind of relationship. The Samaritan man takes his money, his time, his effort, and he takes care of this enemy. He takes care of this stranger in order for this stranger to find life. Me for you. It's the, it's, the, it's the essence of what we have here. The reason why hospitality is such a powerful, profoundly important action is because it demonstrates the gospel for people. My hope for our church, one of my hopes for our church, is that we would be a me for you kind of church. What I mean for that is, is that we would be the kinds of people who don't think primarily about what do I get out of this or don't think primarily about how does this serve me or don't think primarily about that this, this church that we have is about serving our needs, but rather we would be a church that would be thinking and praying and looking for opportunities to use our time, our gifts, our energy, our money in order to bless other people. That's the action of hospitality. Because when we live in this me for you kind of way, what we're doing is we're tearing down the walls that exist and we're making the strangers into our guests we're taking our enemies and we're making them our guests. We're treating them with love and respect. And this is the action of hospitality and why it is so powerful. There are some of you here in the church who every Sunday or several Sundays a month or occasionally you serve on our hospitality team, our welcoming teams. Some of you in here, you, you uh, prepare food for us. You open doors for us, ushers and greeters. You serve communion for us. Some of you drive golf carts in the, in the, in the parking lot. And I just want to say to you this morning, if, if you serve in that team, I just want to say to you genuinely, I just want to say thank you. You are doing something that is more significant than you realize. It is not a small thing that you are doing because every Sunday when you show up, what you are doing is you are tearing down walls for people. You are tearing down walls so people can experience Christ. You're tearing down walls that, that people might build up between relationships. You're making a place for people to belong. And I just want to say what you are doing is highly significant. You might think it's a small thing. Someone else might think it's a small thing, but it's not. It is highly significant. There's others in our church who, who you may not serve on, on one of these teams, but I know of many families in our church who routinely open their doors to other people. And they, and they host people and they, and they welcome people into their homes. And again, I just want to say thank you because what you're doing in those environments, it's not small. It's highly significant. You're making a place for people. You're tearing down walls for people. You're building that relationship with people. You're demonstrating the gospel for people. It's a highly significant thing that you're doing. And so I have a couple convictions. I shared with you at the beginning. One, I said, I believe that God has called all of us Every single one of us who's in Christ, God has called all of us to make a difference, to be a leader, to help shape and influence people. And two, that leadership comes in all kinds of shapes and sizes. It's not about who has the microphone. It's not about who writes the book. It's not about who is on top of the org chart. It's about how all of us take ownership of the gifts, the opportunities, the responsibility that God has given us to impact and influence other people. And so whether or not you have gifts for hospitality, I want to offer this thought to you. There are going to be people in your life every single day that you have an opportunity to tear down the walls. Every single day, there's going to be people that you can host. Every single day, there's going to be a chance for you to take a stranger and to make them into a guest. Every single day, this is going to happen. Every time you come to church, every Sunday, there's going to be an opportunity for you to host the people around you. Every single Sunday, this is going to take place. What would happen if on Sunday morning, instead of talking to our friends in closed circles, we left those circles and went and found the people who are by themselves? That's hospitality. It's tearing down the walls. It's, it's welcoming people in. This is work that all of us can do, and it's highly significant. There are people that you work with, people that you live around. There are people even in your families that, that you have an opportunity to use your time, your money, your influence, your energy, your passion, your life to, to impact somebody else, to serve somebody else. It's a me for you kind of life. So whether or not you have gifts for hosting people or not, all of us are called to a mindset of me for you. A mindset of using what God has given me in my life to serve other people. And in that action of serving other people, we become Lydia's. Where we open the doors for people. Where we welcome people, make space for them. And where we begin to tear down the walls where our strangers and our enemies, they become our guests. And as they're 
lives are opened up and as they're welcomed into the, into the community that we have here, that this is where God begins to move deeply in people's lives. It may be a small thing, but it's highly significant. Let's pray together. And so, Lord, this morning, I, I thank you for the many behind-the-scenes leaders that we have in this church who go out of their way every Sunday to make room for people. Highly, highly significant. But more than that even, I know that you've given all of us opportunities in our lives to reach out to other people, to take initiative, to host, to tear down walls, to serve people. And every single day, there's going to be opportunities for us to use our life, our time, our money, our effort, our energy, our patience in order to serve someone else. Would you help us to become these kinds of people? Me for you. I'm going to use my time, my energy, my effort, my money for you. I'm going to become like the man in the story who goes out of his way to provide for someone else because this is a deeply genuine act of hospitality where we open the doors for others to come and experience what you have for them. Would you use us? Maybe for some of us, there are specific people in mind in our life that we need to host in some way. There's somebody that we work with or live around or somebody that we've seen at church and, and we need to invite them to coffee or lunch or initiate conversation so that they feel welcomed and included in the work that you're doing. This is a good and powerful thing that you have for us. Let us be a me for you kind of church, me for you kind of people. I thank you that you use us. I thank you that you give us opportunities. I thank you, Lord, that you want to include us in this work that you are doing. While it may seem small, it is so highly significant. In the name of Jesus, our Savior, we pray. Amen. You've just watched a video created by Schweitzer United Methodist Church in Springfield, Missouri. Check us out online at sumc.co. And if this video blessed you, be sure to share it with someone else. Thank you so much for watching.